and now from the University of Virginia Center for Politics. Good afternoon. It's my honor to give all of you a virtual, but nevertheless heartfelt welcome to the University of Virginia Center for Politics, especially our very special guest, the Ambassador of Colombia, His Excellency Juan Carlos Pinzon, for a discussion about Colombia, which is certainly one of the United States' most important partners in the Western Hemisphere, and in fact, the whole world. I'm Stephen Mull, the University's Vice Provost for Global Affairs, and I'm very pleased to partner with the Center for Politics in hosting this, the first event in 2022 of the Center's acclaimed ambassador series, which over the years has brought dozens of distinguished international envoys to grounds, immensely enriching our students and faculty's global understanding. And today will be no exception. We had very much hoped to meet in person with the ambassador today to show him around our beautiful grounds and to interact directly with the UVA community. But unfortunately, as it has so often in the past two years, COVID intervened and required us to move this event to a virtual format. Mr. Ambassador, I wanna thank you for your gracious flexibility in working with us to transform our meeting today into a virtual event and to our audience for joining us. Mr. Ambassador, we greatly hope that once we get beyond this latest risk from COVID, that we'll still be able to attract you here in person for a visit so we can share some of Charlottesville's famous hospitality with you. This year, the United States and Colombia will mark the 200th anniversary of our formal diplomatic relations, which resulted from an outpouring of passionate support among the people of the United States for Colombia's brave struggle for independence from Spain, which began in the Colombian uprising in 1810. While President Monroe, on whose farm the University of Virginia stands today, was afraid that moving too quickly to embrace Colombian independence might provoke war with Spain, strong pressure from the US Congress soon forced the president's hand into granting warm recognition to our brave Colombian cousins. While relations between Colombia and the United States have had their tensions over those 200 years, most notably during US support for Panamanian independence during the Colombian Civil War at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century in the context of the Panama Canal aspirations, no one can doubt that today, the United States has no stronger partner in Latin America than Colombia. In an era of increasing polarization on foreign policy questions, U.S. support for Colombia is one issue that has enjoyed strong bipartisan support for more than 20 years, going back to President Clinton's partnership with Colombian President Pastrana to support Plan Colombia, a more than $10 billion U.S. investment into Colombian security and economic development to combat the narcotics trade, improve the human rights climate, and strengthen and modernize Colombia's security forces. Colombia's wise leadership and management over the past 20 years effectively mobilized that assistance to transform Colombia, laying a foundation for strong economic growth, progress against corruption and narcotics trafficking, respect for human rights, and an end, most significantly, to the six decade civil war with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the FARC, a war that killed more than a quarter million victims and forced the relocation of more than four million Colombians. The achievement in ending that war brought then President Juan Manuel Santos the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016 and well-deserved it was. Today, on the basis of the Colombia Trade Promotion Agreement of 2012, the United States has become Colombia's largest trading and investment partner, with two-way trade totaling almost $30 billion in value in 2020. About 450 American businesses are heavily invested in Colombia, and our bilateral agreements on labor rights, environmental protection, renewable and clean energy, and science and technological cooperation have laid the foundation for a highly sustainable economic growth for both of our countries. Colombia has grown into a diplomatic powerhouse in support of democracy in Latin America and around the world, most notably in its strong support 
for Democrats struggling against repression in neighboring Venezuela and in providing refuge for almost 2 million Venezuelans who have fled from there. The University of Virginia feels especially close to Colombia. In 2017, we were very proud to host President Santos as the honored speaker at the university's valedictory exercises, in which, by the way, his son Esteban graduated from our Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy. And the former president has returned to UVA since. Colombia is very well represented in the United States by our special guest today, His Excellency Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon. Ambassador Pinzon has an extraordinary resume. He arrived here a few months ago to serve as Colombia's ambassador in Washington for the second time after previously serving here from 2015 until 2017, during which time Washington's World Affairs Council recognized his mission as the single most effective and best diplomatic delegation in Washington. Before his previous post in Washington, he served for four years as Colombia's Minister of Defense, during which time he oversaw the extraordinary modernization of Colombia's armed forces, effectively ending the civil war with the FARC and bringing peace to Colombia. He was a candidate for president of Colombia in 2018, earlier chief of staff to Colombian President Santos, and he has served in a series of distinguished high-level economic policy positions, including a senior advisor to the executive director of the World Bank, vice president of the Colombian Banking Association, assistant vice president of investment banking at Citigroup, and private secretary and chief of staff for Colombia's finance and public credit ministry. Joining us for our discussion with Ambassador Pinzon today is the University of Virginia's Center for Politics Director for Global Initiatives, Damon Irby. Damon has been with the Center for Politics since 2002, during which time he has been an extraordinary engine for the university's international engagement, leading our highly acclaimed ambassador speaker series, of which today's event is the latest, managing the center's global perspective on democracy, which has brought 1,500 young professionals from around the world to Charlottesville for training on civic engagement in support of democracy, and serving as deputy director of the center's youth leadership initiative that provides teachers at the kindergarten through 12th grade level curriculum support for their classes in civics and government. Ambassador Pinzon, you greatly honor us with your presence today. The floor is yours. Ambassador Mo, thank you so much. You're very generous with your presentation. Uh, first of all, about my country. Thank you for your interest and passion. And I think for these wonderful group of students, I'm almost pretty sure that you know they got a clear message from you on how strong relationship our two nations have and how like-minded we are and how we confront the same challenges of being strong democracies with imperfections, no doubt. Yours, ours, and many others. But fairly speaking, always trying to enhance whatever we have and moving forward to a future in which people is the main objective. No other can be. And I think that's what matters and is why we always need to keep adjusting, innovating, and somehow moving forward in an effective way. I really appreciate uh, also your presentation about uh, you know, my career and, and the responsibilities I have had. What I will tell you is that I'm really frustrated not to be in Charlottesville today. I really was hoping. I've been there a few times before. Uh, you know that Monticello is something that I always will have in my memory for all the reasons you can imagine. You know, for those of us who somehow have the idea of serving in public life, uh, Monticello is a place, uh, a must be place. But there near to Charlottesville as well is Appomattox, which is a place I very especially regarded and as being precisely a Minister of Defense from wartime that led our armed forces to uh, defeat, but at the same time to suffer the, the consequences of war. Uh, Appomattox is very special for the history of the United States. It's very special for the history of the world. Not to forget that uh, in the early stages of our nation, uh, the nephew of Simon Bolivar, 
to spend time at the University of Virginia. So there are many long-term connections that you know have created the University of Virginia, the city of Charlottesville, and everything around. A lot of reasons to be connected and and very well inspired. So I brought for you a presentation today, and we call this is Colombia. And I like just the pictures that you see in front of you, because probably what you see is a country of wonderful, beautiful, natural resources and very special places that you must see. But then you see something that is very important to us. We are a biodiverse, biocultural, uh, at the same time, uh, you know, a country of multiple uh, race, racial, uh, you know, different representations. And we're definitely a, culti a country that is a combining a melting pot of culture, art, race, religion, a little bit like the United States. And that's something we like to, to show. And of course, we never forget the idea that most of the people, when they think about Colombia, they've never been, they don't know that we are a country of cities. There are a lot of cities in Colombia that have more than 500,000 people. And there are several that have more than a million people. And then we have one of the mega cities of the world, which is Bogota, which metropolitan area reaches 11 million people. So, I mean, those are features that I believe are important to remember not to forget two things that matter a lot to us, music, culture, and sports. As you know, every other nation, we are regarded by, by our successful athletes and, and, and musicians and you know, our people. And that's somehow what you present about Colombia. So I have a presentation for you today. The first part, this next slide, we will show you a little bit of what uh, is Colombia in a way. And it's important for you to know that, uh, of course, we are a relatively large country, larger than most people think. If you put it in US terms, we're the size of Texas, California, and Connecticut together in a single map. So it's quite big somehow. We are the fifth largest country in the Western Hemisphere. But when we go to population, then we move up because we are the four largest uh, country by population in the region, we reaching almost 51 million people. Um, of course, that made us fourth after the United States, Brazil, uh, Mexico, and then Colombia. When you think about Latin American economies, Colombian economy has moved to become fourth, you know, and, and, and fifth if you include the United States and Canada. But uh, only uh, Brazil and Mexico will be ahead of Colombia. So even other traditional economies that were larger, like Argentina, uh, are now behind Colombia, not to forget, of course, the dramatic story about Venezuela. Uh, Colombia is a biodiverse country. It's considered to be uh, one of the most biodiverse countries on the planet, and specifically it's considered to be the most biodiverse in terms of uh, 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 per square mile, which you know is very significant to us. You'll see later that we have a lot of special unique species that are very much from Colombia, uh, topping the world onto those. I'll show you later. And then the borders. Colombia has, uh, you know, uh, borders with Venezuela, uh, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, and Panama. But then maritime borders with a lot more countries, with Costa Rica, with Honduras, with uh, Nicaragua, with uh, uh, Haiti, Dominican Republic, uh, among others. So, you know, it's very significant, you know, the size and the space of those territorial wars. Next, please. My next message is very well connected to what you just introduced, uh, Ambassador. And that's the strong relationship between Colombia and the United States for the past 200 years. And I think that's very significant to mention. Next, please. So, yes, by the year 1822, 200 years ago, uh, at the beginning, uh, the House of Representatives recognized Colombia. Finally, the Monroe administration, probably focusing on this idea of the Monroe Doctrine, recognized Colombia as a, a country. There is a statement from John Quincy Adams that, you know, he mainly or almost signaled the following. He said that 
Colombia should be a country that must be recognized because it includes two of the largest rivers of the world, the Amazon, the Orinoco, and you know have some of the greatest chain mountains, but especially has one of the largest territories in the world. And it's meant to be a world power. I think he jinxes us a little, as they said, uh, you know, nowadays, because suddenly that great country that we were, the Gran Colombia, that included Venezuela, Ecuador, half of Peru, Bolivia, Panama, the coast of Costa Rica and Nicaragua of today, uh, relatively fast became many countries, you know? And uh, I think that was an interesting statement from, from John Quincy and so Somehow we, Colombia of today, uh, feel this responsibility of, uh, you know, uh, having this larger nation that is beyond our borders. And that means that we need to be careful and somehow temper if you want on, on, on the things we do. The next slide, please. There are a lot of things that have happened in relationship. There is an interesting uh, case, for instance, when President Manuel Murillo Toro, who was ambassador of uh, Colombia to the United States, got elected president in Colombia. I wish we got we can have those kind of elections. Sitting in Washington and being elected in, in Colombia, I think that was uh, you know the, the kind of election everyone would like. So President Lincoln at the time, who was a good friend of our ambassador, uh, President Murillo Toro, sent him in a boat of the US Navy to the city of Cartagena so he could get to Colombia and take the position of president of the Republic. Uh, you know, I think those are very interesting features. Of course, we had a, a low point, Panama. Panama is something that uh, is in, in our memory anyway. Uh, somehow the U.S., for their own interests, pushed the idea of separating Panama. But nowadays, it's kind of easy to understand in history how Panamanians never felt very much connected to, Col to Colombia, very far from Bogotá at those times, even today with the, with the Arian Gap. Uh, anyhow, I think that the U.S. shows something that was very valuable in our history. The fact that they came a compensation for Panama. So by the end of the 20th decade, the, the 19th decade, the 10th decade better, uh, there came a compensation and finally that allowed the U.S. and Colombia relationship to be strongly established to the point that for the time where uh, Pearl Harbor was attacked. Colombia declared war to the Axis powers. And by the way, confronted the U-boats in the Caribbean. One of our destroyers confronted one of the German U-boats. Our history says that we sank that U-boat. According to German uh, recollections, apparently they just, you know, throw some oil so they could escape from our, from our uh, naval vessel. Our history says we went after it and we did it. So we, we will keep it like that. And then uh, the UN was created. And Colombia was one of those countries that went for the original uh, signatures of the San Francisco Convention. After that, in the city of Bogota, the OAS was created. And I think that was another very important moment of our mutual history. Then Bread and Woods institutions were uh, established and Colombia was one of those countries that came with the United States to create that. After that, uh, the Korean War happened and the attempt against the uh, Korean democracy uh, developed. The consequence was that the UN called for support. Colombia offered support. Colombia sent 5,000 troops and two major uh, naval ships. Uh, more than 300 Colombians were killed in that war, and more than 700 were wounded. But most important of all, U.S. went in the support of our friendly United States, and we were under the U.N. flag, but under U.S. military command, probably for Generals MacArthur and Generals Matthew Richwood. So it's something that really created this very strong bond meal to meal between Colombia and the United States. There is a very strong bond since that time in which a lot of events from our military history have happened connected to the US. And that kept us all the time in the same page during the Cold War with the Soviet Union. Colombia was always at the side of the United States 
and we were always supported by the United States uh, against the you know Marxist revolutions that in, implied guerrillas everywhere and terrorist activities everywhere, of course, including Colombia. But there's a very important feature among uh, about it, as most of Latin American countries were to autocracies, meaning military dictators or one party model, Colombia was the only country that kept democracy. And we have been fighting crime, violence, and fighting for the rights of our people, you know, from democratic values and from democracy. I think that's also a very important feature that connects us. So there have been a lot of events, like uh, President Kennedy came to Colombia in 61 uh, to announce the Alliance for Progress, that probably is one of the best regarded policies in the history of the US for the Western Hemisphere. And you know that happened in the city of Bogota, and I think that was very important. And I have to tell you that uh, after starting with President Reagan, you will see in the next slide, every American president has visited Colombia at a point. So President Reagan did, President Bush, H.W. Bush did. President Clinton, of course, not only did it, but he crafted Plan Colombia with President Pastrana. Then we have President Bush several times. We have President Obama. We have the daughter of President Trump. So he's the only one that didn't visit uh, in the, you know, since President Reagan. And about President Biden, I have to tell you a story. He was almost to visit Colombia in the second week of December. And Omicron came and we got frustrated not to have him. But I have to be fair about him. President Biden has been connected to Colombia more than any president before of the United States. He was the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee at the time when Plan Colombia was crafted. He really pushed for it. Then he was vice president. At the time, the free trade agreement between Colombia and the US was uh, pushed forward. Not to forget that his last trip as vice president of the United States was to the city of Cartagena, Indias, where actually we got uh, the creation of the US Colombia Business Council. About that, later on, we got accession to OECD and we became a non member NATO partner which I think has become a very substantial event. In the past year, a lot of things have happened. So we got support in the past two for the migration problem or the refugees problem from Venezuela. So we worked together into that. More recently, we even offer uh, the opportunity for Afghans to come to Colombia. They never came because the US made other decisions, but we offered that first than any other Latin American country as support to the US. We got 6 million vaccines from the United States as a support to Colombia. So I think those are really very important elements for uh, you know, the conversation that we have had. And I think that that creates and makes evident how close and strong is our relationship. And this is why uh, I think uh, Ambassador was able to present Colombia, Ambassador Mo, as what we have to do. We are the closest ally of the United States in the Western Hemisphere, but the United States is the closest ally of Colombia in the whole world. And I think that means a lot uh, for the times that we're living and for the like-mindedness that we need to, to have. I have to tell you one thing that I've learned about having a strong relationship with the United States are two. First, bipartisanship. That meant a lot to Colombia, and that's how Plan Colombia provided a result. Bipartisanship allowed Colombia to really be engaged with both sides of the aisle and with the priorities of both parties, human rights, institutions, economic development, national security, free trade, business oriented. All these we have been able to work, and frankly speaking, the agenda of both parties have benefit Colombia since we've been working on both sides and both set of ideas. And that has been very useful. The other thing I have found strongly after so many years of being part of the US Colombia relationship is frankness and transparency. Uh, 
as much as we can speak as friends, frankly, on what is being done right, and frankly, on what has become a problem, that is very important. So about the recent events in Colombia, let me give you some thoughts. Uh, I think that Colombia did very well, uh, you know, in a very successful way. Uh, up to 2015, we were like, a, you know, in a rocket. Uh, security was gained through fighting, you know, and let me be fair with you. Nobody gave Colombian uh, people security other than our military and our, our police. Those were the guys who fought, those were the guys who died for our country, and those were the guys who provided a different future for Colombia. But at the same time, peace was a necessary and a big opportunity for us. So that's why most of Colombians thought that a negotiation was the right set of process for Colombia. What happened? Unfortunately, the agreements did not satisfy the majorities of Colombians. And unfortunately, for many of us, it even provide more benefits to drug trafficking than necessary, and the sense that justice was not working as effectively as it should. In a way, excessive benefits for one side of the, of the, of the problem. So part of the consequence today is that we have some worries about impunity in some cases, and some worries about drug problems or again growth. And it's still the challenge of taking development and security to the most marginal areas of Colombia where there are Colombians in need that need to be addressed. And I think, uh, as I said, the importance of the relationship with the US implies that we need to tell the things as they are, not just to say things to look nice, but to precisely work together. Now, let me do a little bit of fast forward. President Duque got to power. There was a lot of expectation for his side to correct some of these problems I described that were in the, in the middle of the process. But then suddenly challenges came as is happening in America, and this is what I found now, polarization and political divide, impeded really moving in an effective process on that. Second, unfortunately we saw that uh, the Venezuelan crisis was really growing by the day. So it was not only, it was like having three balls in the air. One ball was, how do you implement a peace agreement when people is not fully in agreement, but at the same time, you have to take development. Well, as of today, 1,400 projects have been taken to 170 municipalities, providing precisely you know, peaceful solutions and develop. But on the other hand, the Venezuelan crisis implies that more than 5 million Venezuelans have come out of Venezuela, most of them through Colombia. And as of today, you will describe 2 million Venezuelans are living in Colombia. So, that is an environmental issue. It implies that you need to mobilize resources that probably you plan to use for different things. Now we have to use them for feeding, giving healthcare, education, jobs to these people in need. By the way, the whole world has provided a lot of effort to other refugee crises. With the problem with Venezuela, only Colombia and the US and very few support from other places have come. Venezuelan refugee crisis deserves more more effort, more world effort. And by the way, I think that they're not in Colombia just because they like to in Colombia. They're there probably because we're the same nation at the end. And we take that responsibility with a lot of seriousness. They have taken Colombians in other times. Now we take Venezuelans at this time when they need. But why they come to Colombia? Not because they don't like the government, because they don't have jobs, because they have been starving, because they have been prosecuted, because there is no freedom in that country because the democracy there is a mimic, you know, and not something that is really happening. And by the way, of course, Venezuela became the wealthiest country in GDP per capita in the Western, in the Western Hemisphere, Latin America, to become today one of the poorest in the world. Worse inflation, destruction of the economy, destruction of the institutions. Venezuela's in fear running out of their own nation. And thirdly, we got COVID. And COVID hit us hard. So 
when you think about COVID, unfortunately, we got this problem of not only the deaths that are very dramatic, but also unemployment, economic uh, uh, downturn. Those three things at some point combined for some sense of frustration from the people uh, around a year ago. And that was very hard. But you know, the good news is what I'm gonna tell you now. How did we overcome this? How we have put the country, despite all this, to move forward in a positive way. How we have been able to, despite what was going on, recover the economy, recover jobs, recover every opportunity and somehow put the country in a very positive trend, which is what I'm gonna tell you now. Please, the next one. This is very important. When you see the economic history of Colombia, there are only three points in history in the past 120 years of negative growth. Other than that, Colombia has always been growing. And this is kind of unique when you see the numbers of other countries in Latin America and even in the world. Of course, the worst crisis in our history, in economic history, as in the world, the pandemic, the COVID year. But the good news, rebound. Our economy has rebounded in a way that the number appears there was an estimate for the month of September. We estimate right now that when the final number for 2021 comes out, the number will show that Colombian economy grew above 10%, probably 10.5, implying that was one of the top three, top five performance in the world in that year. The good news about it is job creation. We, at some point, got to a level of 24% unemployment due to Venezuelans seeking for jobs, Colombians that lost their job from hospitality, restaurants, and other kind of uh, businesses as the COVID came. And of course, the challenges from implementing peace and development in the marginal areas of Colombia. That was really a problem. And that, of course, implied push, riots, and many things. As the economy has grown back, unemployment is getting again the level of 11%. And that, of course, means that a lot of people have come back, have an opportunity, have an income, and they are feeling, you know, they're at least moving in a positive trend. Next, please. Here, what you see is uh, mainly, <coughs> sorry, the performance. Uh, of uh, some of the, uh, you know, how the economy has performed uh, in 1969. If you use 1969 as a zero, you know, in an index, and you see Colombian performance to Latin America and even to other uh, countries, you see, especially in the past decade, how Colombia really moved forward better than any other economy. The past two decades, you know, since the year, I would say, let's say 2000, 2002, up to the year 2019, we were growing, 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 especially, you know, in the in the years 2002 to 2015. Of course, that downturn is the famous 2020 that hit the whole region and a little bit of the uh, pre-economic uh, crisis of the uh, commodities is starting to happen in the year 2017. But the comparison is very evident. Now about inflation, see that inflation implies that most of Latin American countries have had hyperinflation at a point. Inflation's above 50%. Inflation's, you know, above 100 and 200%. Venezuela's 245% in the 16. Recent numbers show that they, this year, 2021, reached even above 500 in, in, in inflation. Colombia's worst year uh, led Colombia to have 34%, which implies that the country has been able to handle the economy in a positive and let's say rational way, not to say sound macroeconomic uh, policy. Next. This vaccination rate, uh, this is important for us. Uh, these numbers are from early January. As of today, Colombia is reaching uh, around 80% for uh, first dose of vaccination. 
and fully vaccinated are considered already 60% of Colombians, which it implies that we're starting to have better numbers than a lot of uh, larger countries or stronger countries than Colombia. Next, please. Of course, uh, we're very thankful for the U.S. Uh, support in the sense that uh, we got 6 million of the vaccines out of the United States. And being very fair, Spain as well has provided uh, an important number of vaccines to Colombia as well. Next. Nice. This is how the world looks at the end. And in the, in the uh, you know, left side, you see how was the downturn for Colombia, almost minus 7%, and how has been the recovery on 2021. And as I told you, the numbers we're using here are conservative to what we expect. Apparently, Colombia, uh, you know, when 2021 is totally accounted for every country, will be second or third performing the whole world. I think that's great news. Siguiente. Next, please. This is an interesting uh, index. There are two indexes that have been calculated among many during the pandemic. The economist is calculating uh, an index they call the normal index, which is comparing how countries did look like before the pandemic and how they look like after the pandemic in terms of activity, you know, from uh, schooling and uh, uh, you know, uh, work uh, space and other things. Uh, and they include, of course, all that. Colombia is topping the world, is number one right now in that index, implying that the country has become more normal, faster than others. And Bloomberg uh, established a resilience ranking uh, from COVID, trying to understand how the countries were hit in their structural economic basis during the pandemic. Colombia is number six in the world, which shows, you know, a reasonable, not to say positive management of the crisis. And at the same time, how we were able to handle even those terrible moments of last year and really put the country on track and in a positive mood right now. Next. Please. About projections, the Colombian economy, as you see, uh, is expected to grow even faster than most of the relevant economies in the in our area of influence in Latin America, which of course that is very attractive to many of those who are making decisions to invest or to move into markets that have opportunities. Next, please. So let me now follow into trade and investment and tourism. By the way, I like to show pictures because when you see a picture like this, you think that's LA or that gotta be a Singapore or China. No, it's Cartagena Indies. That's our port in Cartagena Indies. So it looks very well, looks uh, very uh, modern. And by the way, there are other ports, for instance, in the Pacific that have new investors. So the port of Singapore has developed a full port in the Pacific in Colombia, in Buenaventura. Just to tell you, you know, that the dynamism and the opportunities are happening even on major infrastructure. Next, please. When you think about Colombia, you gotta think beyond the 51 million consumers, quote unquote, we have. You know, so companies like to see, okay, what is our consumer's potential? What we said is we have 51 million people, which is the fourth largest population in the Western Hemisphere, and maybe around 29 in the world, but, we have access to 17 free trade agreements and preferential access to 60 countries to a market of 1.5 billion consumers on these kind of benefits. And this is very important when you think about new shoring and you know establishing uh, the supply chain. The opportunity of you know seeding a company in Colombia is very important. And why we say this? Because we care for our people. We want jobs in our country. We want people that get training and education so they can perform effectively in the world market. And I think that that's why we insist so much that the opportunity for those established there are very relevant. Next please. So we have a, a, a stable and non mining export base. And definitely we have, a, of course, oil, gas, coal exports that are relevant, but uh, we have, uh, 
important for like coffee, like flowers, like bananas, plantains, avocados, just to speak on the on the on the agricultural world, but not to tell that we nowadays have an important set of uh, exports coming out of uh, non high tech uh, industries. But also we're selling a lot of services, a lot of services that include financial services, law services, and not to forget uh, new tech uh, services. A lot of companies are getting into Colombia for BPOs and other kinds of services that allow Colombian youngsters to somehow use their talent for coding, among other things, and integrate into the world market. Next, please. About the US, there are a few fun facts. So Colombia has, you know, 24% of the of the coffee that is consumed in the US comes from Colombia. I don't have to tell you, we feel very proud to say that Colombian coffee is the best in the world. So please try, you know, but it's very important to say. But more important than all, we're almost on to Valentine's Day. So you know where the roses come from? 64% of every rose you see. You know, out of 100 roses, 64 are Colombians. So, I mean, you can ask them, ask for those because the quality is very high. But now fresh tilapia that even you sometimes can have in different restaurants, including some sushi bars, you know, and you think they're bringing the fish, you know, the white fish from certain part of the world. Well, most of it comes from Colombia, 91% of fresh tilapia uh, that is consumed in the U.S. comes from, from Colombia. Next. What do we take from the US? Basic industry, of course, you know, and uh, this is an industrial country and we, and we take a lot of that. And we take some of the agro-industrial uh, productions of the US, you know, from poultry to corn, you know, to other stuff that, you know, all this has been important through the free trade agreement. By the way, as you see, we like the free trade agreement, has been very beneficial for US exports, not so, to Colombian imports, or Colombian exports. The reason is because I think the US still has too many barriers. So they grant you access to a product, but then when you have to go for the whole due process uh, of sanitary process, it takes years. And then you can sell your products very fast, but hours take more time. Uh, this is the thing I'm telling you because sometimes this create a, a discussion on fairness. You know why we don't get these faster? How do we get how do we get more help to make these faster? Now I think that it's important also to mention that uh, investment has become very important. So about a free trade agreement, is not everything is about exports. It's also tourism. It's also investment, and we have gotten a lot of U.S. investment that has made Colombia more dynamic and an economy. Uh, more uh, effective, more jobs, stronger. Next, please. About investment, Colombia is perceived as a welcoming country for foreign investment. Other free trade agreement that matters, but then uh, there are indexes, like uh, the FDI's uh, uh, Regulatory Restrictions Index, in which Colombia performs uh, you know, better than most of the countries in the region. And then when you see top countries receiving foreign direct investment as percentage of GDP in the year 2019, uh, we are better than most of the countries in the world with the exception of Vietnam, which you know matters a lot these days. Uh, where does Colombia get investors from? The United States, Spain, UK, Canada, and China. In most of the countries of Latin America, the number one investor will be China, not in Colombia. And that explains even a lot of our alignment on, on many, many subjects, which doesn't mean we don't, as anyone, care to make a, a business opportunities and deals with China. Next. I think when you see the, 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 the indexes, to compare competitiveness or to compare, uh, you know, how you look to other countries, Colombia, just to give you one, one number, in the year 2004, we were like seventh country in Latin American competitiveness. 
Now we are third uh, when you measure IMB from Switzerland, World Economic Forum, or uh, doing business from the World Bank. And I think that if trends continue, probably you will be on top uh, five years from now. That's part of our challenge. Now, uh, we have incentives for strategic uh, investors. So when we speak about capital investment, when we speak about education, technology, there are benefits. Uh, we have free trade zones. So we're second on to that in Latin America. So there is a lot of uh, uh, companies that look for Colombia to establish, seeking to use it as a platform to export to other markets. And every time there's defined uh, a program as a strategic, we usually offer uh, certain streamlined processes that allow those investors to be uh, successful. Next, please. The country is connected, and this is a world of technology and connectivity is extremely important. So just to get this idea, more than 36 million users of Facebook, uh, more than 60 million users of uh, Instagram, and when you think about percentage of the eligible audience which read on Facebook, uh, Colombia, you know, is more accessible. It matters a lot for uh, marketing companies, but it matters a lot to show how connected, you know, and consumers are related to the population. More than 60 million mobile phones, and as you might know, more than 12 submarine cables that connect Colombia uh, very much. Next, please. Then digital economy. We're connected, but the implication for the digital economy is very important. We're the third Latin American country uh, in fastest growth in fintechs, and we have become the 14th uh, fintech uh, user in the world. That's really above our, our, our rank. You know, there are other countries that have more technology or more population, and still Colombia is very much move uh, very fast onto those numbers. We have some uh, unicorns of, of Rappi. And I think it's important to say that Colombia became the first Latin American country to put together uh, a strategy for artificial intelligence. So, you know, the ecosystem is being prepared and there are a lot of things going on uh, that are, I can state this, uh, you know, higher than even our own uh, size to put in perspective. Next please. About uh, tourism, I think we have some of the most amazing places in the world. About cities, we have this world city, Cartagena de Indias, a must-see, and I said it's a world city because it's a world heritage city, but at the same time, it really is a jewel of the world to what you will see there beyond, of course, having wonderful restaurants and high quality hotels. What you will see there is history, and very iconic places. But when you speak about nature, you have some of the best and most amazing sightseeing nat national natural parks in the world. Uh, we have the Chiriquete, which is one of the centers of gravity of the planet, a very special and unique place, untouched by men. We have a, 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 some of the most beautiful Caribbean uh, places that you can imagine, and not to forget all their uh, uh, dozens of uh, natural parks uh, that are really uh, very special. Caño Cristales is the picture of that uh, water with red color that is something unique uh, to be seen. And there's a lot of openness. LGBT communities have a, a, a very high regard for uh, Colombia. It's ranked uh, uh, one of the top, not to say the best, uh, in South America. Uh, it's uh, well recognized uh, as uh, having sustainable concepts for tourism. And uh, of course, uh, is chose uh, as one of the top destinations of interest in the world. So I think those are features that are going on. Next, please. I told you about biodiversity. You know, we're the first country uh, by per square kilometer in terms of biodiversity. 
but then we have some very special uh, members. The first country in British biodiversity in the whole world, the first in orchids, the second in plants, amphibians, butterflies, frogs, of course, and freshwater fishes, and the third in ponds and reptiles. And you have more species of those than most of the countries in the world. And of course, the endowment it means, the responsibility it means for climate change and to protect our endowment is extremely substantial. Next, please. About energy transition, Colombia historically had a very clean energy uh, matrix because you know, most of our energy comes from hydropower and uh, natural gas. So 70% of our energy matrix was coming from clean sources. What is amazing is that only four years ago, when we speak about non-conventional renewables, solar, wind, and others, we were almost 0.5% in our matrix. Today, it means 14% of our matrix. So it's one of the fastest growing countries on non-conventional renewables in the whole planet. And that has allowed Colombia to really take the sense and the role of leadership in places like Glasgow, in which we can really speak on protection. So we just, with Costa Rica, Ecuador, and uh, Panama, created the largest protected area in the world uh, in a maritime area. And that's very substantial, as you can imagine. But also, we are really evolving and developing very fast, uh, not only in protecting from deforestation, but also in creating uh, non-conventional renewable sources, which is very meaningful. Next, please. I like this picture more than any other, because why do we do everything we do? Why are we in politics? Why do we do policy? Why do we care for having a strong relationship with the United States? It's for them, right? It's for them. Let's not forget that. You know, we need to enhance our shared vision as we're trying to do right now, just because we think that they need and deserve a better world. And with all the successes, failures, and challenges that we have, we cannot stay in the past. We got to move to the future. And how do you move to the future? Precisely by inspiring your efforts on them, the next generation. Next, please. What are we doing together these days? A lot of things. So first of all, we protect democracy in a like-minded way with the United States. We are fully aligned. And that's why in a very recent visit from Secretary Blinken, he described Colombia as a keystone, according to President Biden, uh, in the hemisphere. And I think that's very relevant and it implies responsibility, but it means that we are against authoritarianism, authoritarianism, that we are against crime, terrorism, criminal enterprises, corruption, that we will work together to confront those by justice means, by policy means, and even when necessary, as we have had in Colombia for many years, confronted them to protect the population using force if necessary. Then we have become together working on the migratory issues. We, as you know already, have taken 2 million Venezuelans inside our territory with a TPS, but also we are trying to provide to the world ideas on how you do this in a humanitarian way. We understand how this is an issue in the United States, and we're trying to be helpful because migration and refugees is not a problem of just those who have to run out of their own turf. It's something that requires policies to help countries, to help communities to stay, to develop on their own territories, not to run from violence as it happens in Venezuela, not to run from a, a natural disaster that never will be revealed, not to run from climate change that somehow is happening, but how we plan this together. And finally, as I described before, on the idea of protection of our planet, and at the same time on energy transition. And in that regard, also Colombia has been taking an important leadership. As the picture shows, you know, the presence of the 
of our countries, Colombia, Panama, Ecuador, Costa Rica, creating that uh, uh, protected uh, ocean highway. Next, please. Now, we have a bright road ahead. And why we do it? Because of our people. Most of what people does not, doesn't know about Colombia is how many connections we have between Colombia and the United States that are not government, not policy, but it's people. Next, please. And these are a lot of people that has a, something in our relationship. You know, we have Sofia Vergara, Ye Baldi, we have uh, Maluma, we have Oshela, uh, we have Shakira, of course, but we have a scientist. But we have a movie like Encanto that somehow, you know, is striking the world to show Colombia in a beautiful, frankly speaking, realistic, but at the same time, magical perspective. And that's what we have these days. So that's what I have for you. I think I have a, a last surprise for you. In next, please. Um, that's the surprise. small surprise. <laughs> well, uh, Ambassador Pinzone, uh, first of all, my name is Damon Irby. I'm the Director of Global Initiatives at the Center for Politics. I want to thank you so much for your, your presentation. You really opened our world to Columbia. I know we learned so much, and I'm personally looking forward to going back and watching again so I can really absorb everything. Uh, we do have, I wanted to share with you a little bit of a uh, significant connection that we have here at the University of Virginia with Columbia and specifically uh, Simon Bolivar through his uh, nephew, Fernando Bolivar. Uh, you can see in this image here, taken just about a couple of weeks ago with snow, Casa Bolivar, where students here at the university who really want to uh, dive into the Spanish language can live and uh, absorb within that community. So of course, it's named after Bolivar, Casa Bolivar. We can go to the next one now. This is just a little um, historical marker on Fernando Simon Bolivar's time here at the university. Uh, also on that building, you know, we're uh, really, we truly value the relationship that we have uh, and uh, 
uh, Fernando Bolivar back in 1827 was truly one of the first students here at the university. Would you mind going to the next slide, please? So this book, this is so special. So Fernando Bolivar later in his life wrote uh, a series of books, one of which is uh, in English, Memories and Reminiscences of the First Third of Revolba's Life. And Revolba was his anagram pseudonym. And what makes this version special, as you can see on the left there, it's been inscribed actually by, by his son the grandson of Simon Bolivar, which um, that is, you know, and that is in our, that's in our university's special collections library. So if we can move to the next. <clears throat> so uh, this book, this image here, uh, it just talks about his experiences at the University of Virginia. And um, I wish I need to go back and learn a little Spanish so I can brush up on that and learn what he said, but uh, it's really fascinating. And I love this. In the image at the top of the screen, you see three books, a listing of three books that were actually checked out by Fernando Bolivar while he was a student. This is in the university's special collection. And two of the books, uh, one is called Woodhouse's Astronomy and Plutarch's, Li uh, Plut Plutarch's Lives, Volume 2, are actually still in the university's library in our special collections. And um, so I, I think that's fascinating. I think the university is very slow to get rid of uh, books and materials. So we are most thankful for that. I wanna thank, uh, by the way, David Weitzel, the curator of the Albert and Shirley Small Special Collections Library for uh, taking those photos for me and, uh, and doing the research to find those. So um, yeah. just wanted to share that, yeah. I want to see it, you know, that's what I wanted to do at Charlottesville, you know, that I'm missing already. <laughs> Absolutely, we'll come out and we will take you there. So I do have some questions uh, for you, Mr. Ambassador. The first comes from student uh, Stacy Vicente. Stacy, would you like to uh, introduce yourself, your year? Stacy is a uh, an Air Force, was in the Air Force, so she has such an amazing background. Go ahead, Stacy. you may ask your question. Hi, Professor um, Pin Pinzon. Um, my, I'm a fourth year here majoring um, in foreign affairs. And um, what a wonderful presentation in welcoming us to Columbia virtually. My question for you is, what is the relationship between Columbia, the Colombian government and indigenous and African Colombian populations? Thank you for that. I think it's very relevant uh, message because one of the major obsessions that our government has had uh, and that the efforts that have happened in Colombia in the past two decades is precisely to integrate more those communities that somehow have been uh, in the past considered uh, in a marginal position. Our constitution provides a lot of benefits for minorities. And that's something that now we're trying to exercise to bring those benefits to Afro and the communities and to indigenous communities. Unfortunately, these communities have been exposed to criminals, to terrorists, uh, precisely because of the lack of presence of the state in certain areas, especially in the past. As much as we have been able to bring security, it's precisely to protect them. But as much as that protection happens, the real challenge is how to bring them real economic and development opportunities. And that continues to be a main, main effort. Now, uh, in the past years, you might see even uh, members of Congress, members of cabinets, and even elected officials from every and different communities. So that's very important. Uh, in legal terms, they have the right of any other Colombian citizen, but in real terms, we do every effort to promote that and to really commit to the promise and make it happen. I will not tell you that there are no challenges. And as I express the areas in which most of those communities continue to be of uh, you know, very high rates of poverty, very high rates of cocaine production, very high rates of presence of crime and violence. And the challenge is to continue to enhance those and really bring uh, development and social protection to it. 
Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Our, our next question comes from Grant Blumberg. Grant? Hi, Ambassador. My name is Grant Blumberg. I'm a, a third year student I'm majoring in foreign affairs. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, some would say that the 2020 American presidential election demonstrated the vulnerability, but also the resilience of American democracy. So my question is, in what ways would you say that Colombian democracy has proved its resilience throughout its history? Well, first of all, thank you for your question. Grant, uh, Colombian democracy is one of the oldest in the, in the hemisphere, second to the United States only, and the oldest in Latin America. While every country in Latin America during the 50s, 60s, 70s, and even part of the 80s held a military dictatorship or a single party government or a caudillo in place, Colombia did not. Colombia had an elected uh, democratic government and I would say with all the challenges, with all the mistakes that can be seen, but with all the commitment to the concept of developing institutions. The 1991 constitution brought Colombia to be somehow modernized in terms of institutional development and framework faster than many others of the region that still are struggling even to have a constitutional council to define you know, a, a more modern constitution. Of course, we have been uh, having uh, elections for uh, to elect mayors, uh, uh, governors, and president in the country for a long time now, more than 30 years for all of them. Uh, in the case of mayors and, and governors starting in the year 1990, uh, that's when it happened. Uh, but also we elect almost everybody. Very recently, in November, we elected for the first time the Youth Council. So people that was uh, under 28 was allowed to be elected for councils that are advisory for every mayor on every town in Colombia, 1,100 towns, by the way. It was 1,100 councils. And that's something new that was created specifically to increase the participation of the youth in democracy. Now we have elections in 2022. And what I can tell you ahead of time is that we have the certainty that August the 7th, there will be a peaceful transition to power, of power to a new president. Who will be the president? We don't know. Could be any one of the candidates that is around. Could be different kinds of candidates. But the certainty is that there will be a peaceful transition of power. And that shows a lot of, uh, you know, commitment to our democratic process. In addition to that, we, as the United States, have independent uh, uh, powers from, you know, every uh, layer of the government. Justice is independent. By the way, we have four high courts. Uh, the legislative is independent. We elect Congress. We elect. Uh, uh, you know, House and Senate, at the same time, at the local level, we elect city councils and assemblies at the governor level, department level. So I think it's very important to, to, to reiterate that our model of democracy is something in which we strongly feel we, we have to lead. And in addition to that, we have a, an independent attorney general an independent controller, an independent general prosecutor, and an ombudsman. I think very few democracies have all these independent players that, of course, my opinion, it would be a lot better if they coordinate better and they try to act, you know, more like-minded. But sometimes independence means that, that, you know, everybody takes the role they ought to. So I think there's a lot of hope for strong institutional uh, democracy. Now, democracies can be at risk, can be at risk by corruption, can be at risk by uh, violence, can be at risk by, in, by intervention of extraordinary powers. And we know that. And since we know that, we try to confront those challenges with different tools in order to protect our democracy from being biased 
or illegally influenced by criminals or by regimes that have their own intentions that are not the same of our people. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I think uh, we'll have one more question and then we'll wrap up. This one is from Nate Jorgegos. I think your mic is off. I actually have, I have his question and it is his question, but I could ask it on his behalf. Um, <clears throat> so his question was, do you think you will once again run for president or are you probably finished with presidential politics? <laughs> That's a great question. Thank you for that. Uh, look, the thing that I'm half uh, absolutely sure and I'm convinced of is of serving to my country. And I will continue to do whatever I can to serve my country, to do the best I can for my country, and even to assume sometimes costs, personal costs, for ideas, for political positions, or for trying to do the best of my country. If that implies that in the future I run again, well, we'll see the conditions and the timing. If that implies I don't run again, well, it will be because you know, we will be calculating what it means in that regard. But my promise always is to serve, serve my country, and that's a vocation I, I feel. Um, even when I am a private sector, a private citizen, I've been engaged on you know different kinds of public service because I care for our nation, and I think it's a duty. It's a duty we have, uh, and it's a duty every citizen must feel. That's at least the way I, I, I feel, and I, I hope you young people that is uh, being educated on these fields. Think more about serving than being served. Think more about doing for your country than trying to do for you. Think more about uh, producing results for the nation than getting the title of fancy uh, positions. You know, you, get, you can get prices, you can get, uh, uh, you know, benefits, you can get uh, uh, being called former president or former whatever. But if you don't feel with yourself in peace, in terms of really serving the country, producing results for the country, and really uh, doing things for others, I assure you, it doesn't matter how power you feel you have, uh, it will not grant you freedom and, and especially uh, happiness in the sense of contribution. Well, Mr. Ambassador, we thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been a true honor, and we do hope to see you in person before too long, uh, Ambassador I Paul. <laughs> I would love to. You know, I wish I wish I to come there to to Casa Bolivar, to the University of Virginia, to Monticello again, and as I said, Apomatos, Charlottesville. What an area we have! Uh, you, you, you guys are blessed. Uh, you kids that have that opportunity, enjoy, please, and being inspired by Jefferson, Monroe, Bolivar. I mean, what else you want? <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you all. And thanks to our students too. I'm sorry we weren't able to get through each of you. Good afternoon, everybody.